Hello, and welcome to Artificial Intelligence. As always, I'm Bart Massey. As always, I hope you're staying safe and doing well in this extremely difficult time. Today, I want to talk to you about probability as applied in the real world to problems requiring intelligence. In particular, I want to talk about decision theory, the close cousin of probability, which describes how to make decisions in the face of uncertainty using probabilistic tools. And I want to talk with you about Bayes' rule, which is a method for deciding or for determining that some people turn into a whole thing and that is maybe a really important idea in AI. Uh, it's, there's a lot there. So let's get started. So decision theory is all about utility of decisions. And by utility, we mean, what are you gonna get out of it? When, we, when we're trying to figure out a decision, say a financial decision, what we wanna do is maximize the amount of money because money is utility for us. If we're trying to make a decision about effort, we might want to minimize the amount of effort because minimum, minimizing effort is utility for us. You got to decide what the utilities are up front. We're going to measure information to try and understand what's going on to help estimate those utilities of various decision options. We'll talk a little bit about the cost of gathering information because that's a big deal too. If you actually have to pay to find things out, that can change the decisions you make because how much evidence is worth gathering before you make your final decision. And finally, we'll talk about Bayesian reasoning and sort of how we make decisions in a Bayesian way. So what's the expected value? Well, if we have a bunch of things that are uniformly distributed, then the expected value is the average. So if we, for example, roll a die a whole bunch of times and add up the numbers we get, if we roll it 100 times, on average, we'll get a value right around uh, 3.5 because the average, you know, the sum from of the numbers from one to six is uh, I can do this. The sum of the numbers from one to six is uh, n times n plus one over two is uh, six times seven is forty two over two is. 24 and uh, so we're going to get uh, something like uh, now I got to be careful because of, of the way I'm dividing but I got to divide that by um, yeah and so I end up with after I do the math here what I'm going to find out is that If I take the number of times I roll, 100, and I divide it by that sum, then I'm going to get a, uh, divide that sum by it, then I'm gonna get three and a half here. And three and a half is weird, because three and a half is neither three nor four. The, num the dice literally never come up exactly three and a half. But on the other hand, if I had to pick a value that I expected it to come up, it would be, you know, on average three and a half. And in general, if the probabilities are something, then we get the expected value being the sum for the events in our set of that event's uh, value times the probability that that event occurs. And that equation, the expected value equation, is a super important equation. It does all kinds of things. That tells you your Vegas odds. If I, uh, 
you know, if I, for example, in a poker hand, have a 30% probability of, of earning $10 on my next move, and I have a 70% probability of losing a dollar, well, even though it's way more likely that I'll lose a dollar, on average, the, the expectation I'll get is um, $3 divided by, uh, you know, $3 positive plus 70 cents, you know, minus 70 cents negative. And so that looks like a pretty good bet. I should probably make that bet. Even though I'm gonna lose it more often than not, when I win, I'm gonna be big enough to cover my losses, and that's the expected value thing. So if you have a whole bunch of actions you might pick, you have to pick one of, you have some choices, well, then we just compute the expected value of each action and we pick the one, the action that maximizes the expected value. Let's do the thing that'll work out the best on average, or at least that's a thing you can do. Now you gotta be a little careful here because utility ain't what it, it ain't always what you think it is, right? If you had a bet that would cost you $10,000 if you lost, but make you a billionaire if you hit, even if the probability of hitting was very low, expected value would tell you, take that bet. But maybe you can't really afford to lose $10,000, so maybe that $10,000 has a lot of utility to you relative to the billion dollars. So it isn't just you get to do the math, but if all else being equal, then you get to do the math and it tells you, take the bet if, uh, what is, how many times does 10,000 go to a billion? Um, 100,000 times, I guess. You know, if the probability of getting the billion dollars is greater or equal to one in 100,000, and that's how lotteries work, right? People give up an amount of money that doesn't have very much utility for the, to them, hopefully, be in for a very, very slight probability of getting money that has a lot of utility to them or at least that's the theory of lotteries in practice. If you evaluate how lotteries actually work, a bunch of people make really bad decisions and give up money that would have a lot of utility for them, uh, you know, and it doesn't work out for them. On average, but somebody will get lucky. So sometimes all you know is the probability and you know your expected effect value here is just gonna be a probabilistic thing and you maximize over that, and you're now, you've now got your utility function that's working for you. And that's essentially all there is to decision theory. You figure out your probabilities and you go from there. Now I'm gonna to shift topics for a little bit, and then we'll come back to our decision theory at the end. Suppose I have some evidence and that I've acquired of some thing. And so the event that I got the evidence has some probability PR of the evidence, you know, probability of getting that evidence. Uh, I have some hypothesis, and there's some prior probability of that that hypothesis was true. So I supposedly also know the probability of getting the evidence given that the hypothesis holds. So I've got this third probability in hand. I've got three probabilities. What are the probability that evidence will turn up? Uh, What's the probability of the hypothesis in the first place? What's the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis? And the if I have those three things, Bayes' rule tells you what the probability of the hypothesis holds given the evidence is. Now, why is this important? Because it's important because these three things are things that a lot of times you can practically gather, or at least... Uh, this one's pretty easy to gather a lot of times, and this one is easy to gather um, sometimes. Uh, the probability, or sorry, this one's easy to gather. The, yeah, the probability that the evidence holds independent of the hypothesis is confusing, but we'll make it all come out, cal out in the wash to some extent. But 
what we're going to do then is turn it around. So we found some evidence, you know, given some hypothesis that is evidence of some hypothesis. What we want to know is how likely is it that the, the, the hypothesis happened given the evidence we've found. Again, a little poker example here. You know, I see that um, a second ace come, two aces come on the flop. Before the flop, I know what the probability was that my opponent held an ace. Is it more or less likely now that I've seen two aces come on the flop? Well, it's less likely. And so now I can start to make decisions based on that, but I'd like to quantify it. I'd like to know what the probability is now that my opponent holds an ace given that there are two aces on the flop. And I can compute that by Bayes's rule, which we mentioned last talk, which you can just derive, we derived it last talk, but it comes out like this. The probability of the hypothesis given the evidence is the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis times the probability of the hypothesis divided by the probability of the evidence. Now all that's pretty abstract and it is traditional and so I shall do it at this point to ground this all in an example that's a medical diagnostic example. Let's say that our hypothesis is in this case is the you have Glaubner's disease. Doesn't matter what Glaubner's disease is, but we think you might have it. And we have a test we could run, Reaper's test. And so we'll make H be the probability that you, you know, the probability of H be the probability that you have Glaubner's disease. The probability of E be the probability that Reaper's test is positive. And so the, we'll say that this is a rare disease. It's literally one in a million that anybody has Glaubner's disease. And so the probability of that we will set up front. We've done a bunch of studies, we've counted populations, and we know that it's one in a million that somebody has Glaubner's disease. One in 10 to the minus six. Let's say this is a soup. Reaper's test is a silly accurate test. It's more accurate than almost any test that you run into in medical situations. Let's say that the false positive rate of Reaper's test is really low. The probability that Reaper's test returns positive given that you don't have Glaubner's disease is only one in 10,000. Only one in 10,000 times does it report that you have Glaubner's disease when you don't in fact have Glaubner's disease. So we got that probability. Let's also decide that the other way around is even better. The probability that I have, that it shows that I have Glaubner's disease given that I do have Glaubner's disease is perfect. If it tells you you have it, you have it. Um, you know, if, if you, sorry, if you have it, it tells you that you have it. 100%, no questions asked, infinitely, unlikely that it will make a mistake. Real tests aren't like this, but this one is for some reason. Now, what's the probability of the hypothesis given the evidence? Well, um, so that is, what is the, your test comes up positive. What's the probability you have Glaubner's disease? Well, we do our naive Bayesian calculation. We do this, um, and then we're gonna take this uh, term here, that's the probability of the hypothesis given uh, H divided by probability of E, and we're gonna rewrite it to be the probability of the evidence and the hypothesis, or the probability of the evidence and not the hypothesis. And that's gonna be okay because of these assumptions we made right here. We rewrite all this uh, then again using the definition of and and or for these independent things, and we end up with uh, this. We end up with a one in a million chance that you have the disease. We have the probability that you get a positive test given that you don't have the disease being one in 10,000. The probability that we don't have the disease, right, is one minus the probability we do. So this is about a number that's about one. It's, um, you know, 999,999 in a million. And then we have the probability that you um, have the disease times the probability of this, which is one. So this is just one E minus six. And so this denominator is 
you know, this term's small compared to, so this term is roughly one, I can throw it out. This term then is large compared to this term, so I can throw this term out as an approximation. And I end up with one in a million divided by one in 10,000, which is one in a hundred. That is, if I take this crazily accurate test and it says I have Glaubner's disease. That was the probability of, you know, of that, you know, that's this probability, right? It says I have Glaubner's disease, this probability E here. So if it turns out that I do, then the probability that I actually have Glaubner's disease is 1%. Ouch. In other words, yeah, the false positive rate is low, but it's not low enough. The disease is super rare compared to the false positive rate. And so on average, when I get a positive, I have to kind of assume that it's a false positive. There's only a 1% chance that it's real. The obvious question at that point is, should I bother to have this test? And the answer is probably not, especially if the false negative rate, instead of being perfect like this, is also non-zero, non-one. Um, you know, the, if the test isn't perfect going the other way, then the math gets more complicated, which is why I didn't do it, but it really noises things up now, because now maybe if I have Glaubner's disease, it's much more likely that the test will show negative Oh, this is gross. And so you don't learn much from the test. And this is important, and good doctors know that this is important, and they pay attention to this. And you hear people saying, well, why doesn't insurance pay for this test? Well, there's a lot of reasons, and most of them are terrible. But one of the good ones is, well, because the test really doesn't tell you anything in these really rare cases. And I know that because I've been there. I, I, at one point in my life of complicated medicine, was suspected of having a very, very, very rare genetic disease that could cause a lot of symptoms like symptoms I was having. And the doctor said, yeah, there's a test, and I don't recommend you take that test, and here's why. And essentially laid out this Bayes rule argument, explaining that the test doesn't really tell you anything relative to your probability of having the disease. And so we both agreed that there was no point in doing the test and went on with our lives. So if you take this kind of reasoning, you can build a thing called a Bayesian belief network, which now, instead of just having an evidence and a hypothesis, you might have chains of prior hypotheses and results, right? So maybe if it's cloudy, that makes it less likely that you use a sprinkler, but more likely that there's gonna be rain, that there's that it's raining. And you wanna know, you know, maybe you wanna know about wet grass. Well, the wet grass is gonna be caused by either the sprinkler or the rain, let's say. Let's say that's how your model works. So we just make up a model, right? We pick one. And the question is, what's the probability of wet grass given that it's cloudy? Well, I can compute this term, and I can compute this term, and I can compute this term, and I can compute this term. And uh, some of these probabilities are even close to one. And I can decide. Um, you know, okay, it's cloudy, what's the likelihood the grass is gonna be wet? Which is useful if I'm going to the golf course, let's say. But I could go the other way around, too. I, you know, I see a photo with wet grass. What's the probability that photo was taken under cloudy conditions? Well, you know, it was either a sprinkler or the rain, and, uh, you know, what are those probabilities? So this kind of reasoning, this diagnostic reasoning, the causal top-down reasoning, or the bottom, up diagnostic reasoning are essentially done using Bayes' rule, taking this stuff into account. Uh, the book talks about polytrees, which is a special case of what's called Bayes' network. So this is what's called a Bayesian belief network, if you fill in all the probabilities here. And a Bayesian belief network is a powerful tool for thinking about how problems are going to work out in the face of uncertainty. The math gets 
fancy and the computation gets high really fast but of course compared to neural modern neural nets computations don't get so expensive the biggest problem with bayesian belief networks as a system for thinking about the world is that there's all these prior and conditional probabilities, right? What's the probability that it's cloudy? What's the probability that it rains given that it's cloudy? What's the probability that it rains given that it's not cloudy, right? Uh, you know, all of these things, you have to sort of measure a crazy number of things. And a lot of them are hard to model, so I'm gonna effectively have to learn them. And where this leads is where we're going next as we talk about artificial intelligence, which is into the world of machine learning. I'm gonna talk about something called naive Bayesian machine learning very shortly, which is I think one of the easiest machine learning techniques to understand and that makes use of this kind of probabilistic reasoning. I'm gonna end by sort of pointing out that there's a lot going on here. The, the topic of probability is complicated right there's sort of three things that are different but people tend to treat them as the same in casual conversation there's there's a 50 percent probability of this there's i don't know which of two things going to happen and a third way you might think about it is i don't care whether it's going to happen or not and those three things all are kind of different, even though they feel the same. There was an XKCD recently calling out one of the things that's always driven me nuts about contestants in these television reality shows. They get down to two competitors, and one of the competitors will say, yeah, it looks like it's 50-50, and the other one will be like, yeah, it's 50-50. Well, surely neither of them believe that, right? Surely neither of them believe that it's equally likely the two of them will win. It's surely having watched these competitions there's one of them that's way more likely to win and surely that one believes they're more likely to win probably the other one believes they're more likely to win too right it isn't 50 50 or the contest would be decided by a coin flip right it's decided by actual stuff and yeah there's a probability that a weaker contestant will beat a stronger one but it ain't 50% in any meaningful scenario and yet that's kind of our casual way of talking about probabilities uh, there's an old medical diagnostic system called Mycin, which used these, this Bayesian belief network kind of public, um, probabilistic reasoning to do actual medical diagnosis a long time ago, many decades ago. And um, it would try to reason about the likelihood of particular diseases and it would try to order the diseases by their likelihood that it predicted. And so you'd stuff a bunch of evidence at Mycin and it would go through a database that told it a bunch of facts about how that evidence related, probabilistic facts about how that evidence related. It would do a computation and then it would rank candidates for the disease causing the symptoms in its order of likelihood. Now what it didn't do is attach probabilities because the probabilities were kind of meaningless. There's just not enough information to get really accurate probabilities. When Spock on original Star Trek or whoever says, oh, the probability of that happening is one in 179,342, you know, it's not just baloney because yay rapid calculation, it's baloney because you can't possibly have enough information to compute things that precisely in these situations. There's no computer, no matter how omniscient, that could know exactly what the probabilities are. And so Meissen would rank order things and say that things were like more likely or less likely. Doctors didn't like that. They didn't like anything about Meissen. It was too early and people were afraid of what that system might do, even though it was ever only ever offered as an aid to doctors. It was not meant to replace them. It was meant to make suggestions, especially about things the doctors might not have thought of because the medical world's a complicated place. But one of the things that they tried to be really careful about was, you know, saying, look, you know, likelihoods aren't probabilities. And the other place where this comes up a lot is the weather. Uh, so when somebody says there's a 70% chance of rain, what does that mean? Does it mean that if I measured, you know, if I, if I, I, 
you know, first of all, how do I even do that experiment, right? Well, there's a 70% chance of rain, so I will have tomorrow's weather 70, you know, 100,000 times and see if the answer comes out about 70%. No, probably not. I can take all the times that there was predicted to be a 70% chance of rain over a year and get some really low accuracy measurement of whether it really did what rain 70% of the time. But everybody knows, right, that those aren't probabilities. Everybody knows those are likelihoods. What what the weatherman means when they say there's a 70% chance of rain is they say, oh, you know, it's probably roughly twice as likely as not that it's going to rain. Well, how do you know that? Well, because I did some, I looked at some similar situations and did some calculations. But if you really made them ground it in actual probabilities, the whole thing would fall apart. Um, or at least historically, that's how it was. I guess I don't know with modern weather modeling whether that situation has changed. So watch out for models that look great and are all precise and stuff and full of probabilities, but the probabilities don't really connect very well to the real world. There's a theorem floating around called Cox's theorem that says sort of under some fairly reasonable assumptions, if you take logical sentences and label them with real numbers, you can find an interpretation of that that's consistent with probability. That is that, you know, you can read that theorem in a couple different ways. One way is to say that, well, probability really is the natural way to represent information about the real world. Another way is to say, well, this theory predicts way too much. If, you know, sort of all such systems work out as probabilistic systems, maybe we should be suspicious that probability is too general an answer. The point is you end up in some deep th philosophical waters really fast. The other thing we should watch out for that we've already seen is measurement issues are real, right? Small changes in, the, in, a, in a measurement can have big effects on the computed probabilities. And numeric issues are real. It's really easy to do the math wrong in some small decimal place. We saw what happened you know, with something as simple as how many times do you roll snake eyes? It took a lot of measurements to converge on the two probability, even though, even though you know, that's a fairly simple system with a fairly large signal compared to a lot of systems we play with in the real world. So yeah, that's sort of more of the story of how we think about decisions and how we think about making probabilistic decisions. And we will go on and have some future talk where we talk about naive Bayesian machine learning and how we can apply this in a really easy to digest form that's proven to be pretty powerful. Hope that was helpful. Please do stay safe and stay well in this difficult time. And I enjoyed talking to you. I thank you for listening, and I look forward to talking to you again soon.